here's my script. Um, could you read okay, it? Okay, yeah. And move that let's script edit here. this part yeah. out. Okay. Going ten one. Rain dance. Sun dance. Con. Let's do this. You guys ready? Quiet Thank you so set. much for this award. Ready and action. Welcome back to Mel Moment Mondays. I'm your host Mel, and today we have a fantastic editor, Trent Burns. Thank you so much for hopping on. Yeah, of course, Mel. Thanks for asking me to uh, to sit down and nerd out. Always fun to do it with like with with people that like you know are like either local or as we were just kind of talking about people that um, I haven't seen in a while. So hopefully this is this is going to be a fun one. <laughs> yeah. So my first question for you is like, how did you get into filmmaking? Um, what was kind of like your process? Did you go to film school or anything? Um, kind of walk me through that. Yeah, sure. Um, and this is going to sound real familiar if you've had a chance to check out Dee Dee, but it stirred up a lot of things for me because I'm one of those kids who first picked up a camera because I was the worst skater in my group of friends. <laughs> um, that trope from that movie is absolutely true. If you're the worst skater, you're kind of the default filmer. Um, <laughs> So that was like my first real excuse to pick up a little like mini DV camcorder. Um, I can't remember exactly when my parents got that for me, but it was, it was, there was a campaign of many months for probably a Christmas or birthday gift. Um, so yeah, I started picking up a camera just to film dumb, bad skate videos with my friends. Um, but I think that also, um, I've talked about this before, but I think that uh, is totally a part of my pathway to editing and especially being in like the documentary and nonfiction world is um, as dumb and terrible as those skate videos were it's all about like sorting through footage and like you're not it's it's not like narrative where you know you might have a couple takes but you've got someone marking the best take or whatever it's it's either just like you get the shot or you don't get the shot um, and you kind of have to cobble everything together in post and that also is my first experience like touching editing software is making those silly skate videos um so that yeah that's how i first got into it as a hobby or just messing around i mean i was pretty young at that point so i definitely did not think it was going to be anything that i went to school for I actually i didn't enter school for film at all um i showed up at American University in Washington, D.C., thinking that I would study international politics, um, which I'm still interested in, but um, I realized partway through college that that's not 100% what I wanted to do, and I actually switched over to PR because it seemed very employable. Um, and PR is actually where I got, I, I linked back up with video um, because all of my prereqs, I, I just chose all of like the like visual media <laughs> themed prereqs because you know because I liked um, shooting and editing stuff and photography all, all on like a hobbyist level so I just sort of naturally picked those and then realized yeah I, I can talk about this there, I basically realized there was a loophole which meant that I could do both the PR degree and the film degree in basically the same amount of time like like I, I, I didn't really have to spend any extra time in school um, because I had found this loophole where all these prerequisites overlapped um, so anyway, the point is I came to film school still not because I wanted to, you know, do like studio system. It still wasn't like this artistic, like I must be a creator. It was like, I should learn how to use Adobe software because all of my, um, like communications classes and God, it'll make me sound old, but this is, this is like 2015, 2016. <laughs> so this is like Instagram is allowing videos more than 60 seconds and TikTok's not around yet, but like short form is starting to like show its first signs in like um, people were making really highly edited like stories and they're sort of like the precursor to like reels. The, the point is I realized that like cutting video was becoming very employable as well. Um, and when you go through a four year school, you're definitely thinking about, you know, when you get to the other side, you're like, oh God, now I need to have a job and make money. And um, <laughs> Anyway, that's the long version of saying that I, I kind of came to film school not from the traditional angle of wanting to, uh, you know, direct like a feature, a narrative feature or something like that. Um, but I came to it because I loved editing and, use, you know, basically using the tools to make fun stuff. Um, and it's kind of expanded from there. That's so cool how you kind of just like literally fell into it and it wasn't like necessarily your first choice, but it turned into like kind of like, oh, your passion turned into your job, into your hobby, into your X, Y, Z. Yeah, I, I never mind telling the longer version of this because I think 
it's it's easy to think that you either need to co come to production stuff, like come to this type of creative work because you've known since you were seven that you wanted to direct a feature or something like that, or there's a lot of people who, you know, stumble into it sort of in like the creator economy, but, but I'm talking about people who start on maybe YouTube knowing absolutely nothing and through that process of building their YouTube channel, like become very good videographers. I'm like, some, I'm weirdly somewhere in between where I always liked it. I just never thought that I would be able to make it. I just never thought I'd be able to pay, pay the bills with it um, the way <laughs> I'm able to now. Um, but that's a process of learning that like, that looks different for everyone. And, um, you know, ma making it your, your full-time work has so many different, there's so many different versions of that. And so I'm always happy to talk about this weird in-between where um, I didn't discover that I loved visual media you know, late in life, I always knew I liked that, but I did discover that I could survive and, and earn a paycheck <laughs> uh, pretty late in the game. Right, right. And then, and then I know you, I, I think we connected while you were still in New Zealand, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, how did that end up happening? And do you, do you see any difference between like editing styles there? I presume you, you were doing some video work over there and mm -hmm. then versus over here back in the States where you are now, obviously. Yep. So to super quickly rehash, um, I wound up in New Zealand in February of 2020 with my now wife, Zoe, uh, because we just, you know, we had worked uh, our first full time jobs after graduating college for a few years. And we just had that moment where like we went straight into work after school, um, which which is great in some ways and what you want in some ways. But we had that moment where we decided we, we needed to like take a take a beat and do a trip or something like that. And so we, we had other travels planned besides New Zealand, but that was the first stop and we were going to be there for a couple months. And as I said, we arrived in February of 2020. <laughs> so we decided to stay. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've told this story a million times, but we decided to stay. Um, obviously it was, you know, a little bit of a leap of faith at first that clearly worked out for the better. And we ended up living there for about a year and a half um, until June of 2021. And what, uh, one other piece of context I'll give because I, I love hyping this up, is we were there on something called a working holiday visa, which means you can take, um, you know, you can work in cafes or um, we worked in a hostel for a little bit. It allowed me to take uh, freelance work. Um, it basically, it, it's basically a temporary working visa that just excludes you from anything like serious enough that might count as like an immigration bid. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because if anyone is interested in traveling in New Zealand, Australia's got one. I'm blanking on, I think South Korea's got one that Americans can do. These are available in multiple countries. Um, everyone has slightly different rules, but um, yeah, go look up working holiday visas if, if you are interested in traveling, but are intimidated about uh, doing so for a longer period of time and not being able to earn more money. Um, you're not gonna get rich from these things, but it will <laughs> uh, allow you to travel and like supplement the income that way. So that was just my quick soapbox on like everyone should do this if you know you're into travel. There's there's ways that you can make that happen. Um, but back to your original question of did I notice uh, many differences? I feel like outside of really nerdy technical stuff, like for example, like here I'm often cutting things in like 24 frames per second timelines or 30 frames per second timelines. New Zealand is in a different region, so they default to like 25 frames per second. Um, so like when I when I read over this question, I was like, I doubt she wants me to get that nerdy, but maybe you do. So I'll throw that out there. Go for it. <laughs> um, the, yeah, there are there are weird little regional differences like that. Um, but that's the type of thing that you kind of just fi you figure it out as you go, like with with each client. Um, but I, really, I didn't notice a ton of difference because I was working on such similar stuff to what I was doing at home. Um, wedding stuff, corporate and commercial stuff. Um, in general, I found a lot of my clients were, were more trusting of their editor. Not, this is a pretty blanket statement, but um, <laughs> be, because I was doing relatively cut and dry assignments and it wasn't like highly creative work, they were pretty trusting with just giving me an outline or a brief and kind of leaving me alone for, you know, a week or two weeks and then I would return a video. And, and of course, there, you know, there would be small feedback here and there, but um, I appreciated what I perceived as an increased trust in the editor as kind of, like I was almost treated more like a tradesperson 
um, oh, like almost like an electrician or a plumber where it was sort of like they would look at my portfolio, make sure my credentials were in check. And then it was kind of like, well, we paid you to do the thing. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I never had a situation where anyone was super unhappy with what I turned in. But it always seemed to me that I don't I don't know, I'd, not in a negative way, but they kind of just didn't care. They, they were like, oh, we gave you the brief. You executed the brief. Cool. Like, thanks. See you for the next one. And it wasn't like a million rounds of, of feedback or whatever. But I, as I'm saying this all now, maybe you should just scratch that because that could just be coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that that's interesting, though, like that where it it is is it's looked at differently like here like if you're gonna hire a videographer i feel like people are like not that they're not being picky but it's like very much like who's the most creative out of you know the Mm -hmm. pool of people versus there it's almost like we need this done we need an a to b who can execute this oh okay they can let's hire them kind of thing right and maybe that's just the difference in some of the jobs i was taking but um I guess I, I, I could say, you know, the other side of this coin is that, like, I didn't have nearly as much creative input on average. Um, I mean, a, a lot of the times the projects just there wasn't creative latitude like that. I mean, um, like, I'll, I'll be a little more specific. So, some of my, like, really good stable contracts were um, cutting down big, long webinars for, like, government clients, which is crazy that I was I was <laughs> I was cleared. I mean, it, it was the connection was made through mutual friends, but like they had no problem hiring a, a foreign freelancer to, uh, it wasn't anything super sensitive, but it was, you know, these big, long COVID era government webinars and meetings and stuff. And they just needed someone to deal with that for archival purposes. So there's like no, there's no room to be creative in that. Literally nothing. Um, <laughs> but when it came to stuff more like, um, I did quite a few uh, wedding edits where I was either taking work off of s- someone's plate who was really busy, or I got hooked up with essentially a ghost editing service, um, which worked out well because I didn't have to shoot anything. Um, and perhaps on the downside, I didn't really have creative input because I just, uh, you know, I received the brief and sort of a couple golden samples from that particular shooter. And then it was my job to chameleon to that style. Um, which is a a really important part of editing if that's the assignment. But I guess that's what I mean when I say like, there was really no latitude for creative comment on my part. I I wasn't there to suggest to this wedding shooter, you know, here's how we could make it better. I just needed to get it done. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, um, kind of deviating a little bit from that, but you're also a musician, right? With a kind of a, a musical sound ish background how does that affect the way that you edit um and and the types of edits for like let's say a wedding or stuff since you do more kind of like corporate wedding type of type of work mm-hmm. um how do you yeah how, how how does that carry over into into that um since it's like not necessarily a narrative and it's not necessarily a doc right um so i think of two main things when i think about the the influence of being a musician on editing and the more broad observation I've had is that musicians make great editors because, um, you know, whether you're cutting to music or not, it's really, and I'm probably going to make a lot of comparisons and analogies to playing music, you know, as, as we keep chatting, but, um, you know, editing is very, uh, musical. It has a cadence, it has a rhythm. Um, it, it's not always highly rhythmic. Like, uh, we, I chatted to you recently about Baby Driver, and that's like the ultimate rhythmic editing, which is actually why I went back and watched it, as I was like trying to think of a good example of the extreme of, of, of this, and, and that's an extreme for sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, like e- even if it's not like that, where you're not cutting to a song, uh, the way that people speak, especially in, in interviews, uh, in, in the doc world, and even in narrative, like there's, there's cadence and rhythm and impact and delivery. Um, whether that's someone delivering a written line or or someone stumbling upon a really profound thought in an interview. And so at, at a really broad level, I think of editing very much the same way I think about playing music in terms of uh, both visually and pacing wise, um, there's kind of do's and don'ts, right? And like if you, I guess to give like a visual example, you don't typically, you don't typically want to like play one note over and over and over again. So I'm not going to do wide shot, wide shot, wide shot, wide shot. <laughs> unless you're making it a thing like you can in music you can make you can if you do it with intention you can make it a thing and that makes me think about 
uh, like a lot of these montage sequences you'll find in Wes Anderson films where it's like ultra wide shots in the subject or a building kind of stays in place in the center of the frame. So like there's an example of like you're just doing wide, 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 but it kind of works because you're doing it for a reason. But if you're not doing that, you want to think about things like, you know, the, the, the visual flow of a scene in my weird little brain is very musical. And if, if you're playing the same note too often, it's going to lose impact. Or if you're playing too many notes all at the same time, if you're cutting too quickly, or if you're losing visual cohesion, you know, the, the, the eye line is from here to here. And now all of a sudden, you know, you've, you've pushed to the edge of the 180 degree line and the eye lines aren't the same anymore. That's again, unless you're doing it for a very specific reason, that's going to come off like you flubbed a note. Um, right. So that's one way I think of editing as, as very musical is, uh, yeah, I, I did not wrap that up well, but that's one way that I think of editing as, as pretty musical. And I can that's... give you, if you want, I can give you a quick, clean, like ending thought so you can just stitch it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. If you think of one, go for it. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll just get, I'll just give you a clean, like, and so that's one of the ways that I think of editing as actually very similar to playing music. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so interesting. I feel like, uh, I mean, like, I, I feel like a lot of my friends um, have turned out to be editors, but I've never really sat down with them to think, to talk to them about, like, what is your process? I feel like in film school, it's very, like, they teach you more, like, how do you cut dialogue or how do you, like sync together a broadcast clip or something like that and i mean like i feel like editing is so unique in 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 the fact that that's where the story comes to life you know it's it's through the script and then it's through the shooting but it's really like after all of that it's what you're left with you know whether it's doc or whether it's you know narrative or whatever it is it's in the edit where the story like really starts to breathe so and every editor has its own has has their own has their own way of editing. It's just really interesting to hear kind of from as you said like a, a musical background that you think of it in such a musical way when you are editing because it's for me when I when I like kind of when I direct I direct very much like a cinematographer. I see things like as if it were a movie, and not everyone sees it that way. So I think that's just kind of kind of cool just to like kind of like pick at your brain a little bit. Um, what, what, what do you think is the key to a good edit? You know, after, after being all that said, you know, what do you think, do you have a specific style per se, or is there something that someone should not do while editing that would really rub you the wrong way or that's like a total no, no. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think th this, this actually is another reason why when I was reflecting on this, this is another reason why I went back and watched uh, baby driver because part of <laughs> Part, part of how I want to talk about this is like, I, I, sorry, let me back up. I have come to think of myself a little bit more like, as I described in New Zealand, like in most cases, I'm thinking of myself as kind of more like a tradesperson. Like I'm there to help execute a vision. doesn't mean I don't have my own creative ideas or I don't have, you know, little pet projects that I like, but as an editor, as a professional editor, I'm there to help execute a vision. And so with that in mind, I think of, you know, two major schools of editing um, and this kind of I'm borrowing heavily from from some of my college classes but I, I tend to think of things as either invisible editing or very visible editing you know, baby driver is a very visible editing style <laughs> like the the editing is part of the enjoyment of watching that film um, everything everywhere also comes to mind like one of my current favorites if you're an editor and you watch that movie it just melts your brain in the best way possible um, but then invisible editing would be something more like, I, I recently saw Didi, I thought there was really good invisible editing in the sense that it, uh, it, it blends into the story. It, it's, everything is in service of the story. You're not really supposed to notice the editor's job. And so that I think, bo both things can make for really good edits, but I think as a professional editor, I always try to identify with a director or a client if it's you know commercial or corporate. Um, what they're looking for. And obviously corporate is al almost always looking for you to disappear into the background. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, sometimes you do like promo work where like they very much want the edit to be part of the style because they want it to be eye catching. They want it to um, stand out in a very busy, uh, you know, social media landscape. Um, and then and then heading over to the more like creative, like pure documentary. Um, I, I do 
dabble here and there on narrative projects. I'm an equal opportunity editor. If it's a fun project, you know, with, with people that I like working with, I'm, I'm always stoked to take it on. <laughs> um, but yeah, t talking with the people running the project, whatever that means, and getting that baseline understanding of what my job is. Am I blending into the background or are you coming to me because you want me to make something noticeable? Um, yeah, I think I think that's both of those I think make for good edits, but to to summarize, I think my golden rule for what makes a good edit is, you know, what executes the vision according to what the director of the project wants. And that's I I don't feel any I don't feel any weird ways about that. Like I said, I have my own creative stuff, but um I think that's one of the fun parts of being a a professional editor is is, you know, you can really be the linchpin that takes someone's idea from the storyboard and um, you know, ideally you're getting good footage and everything. Like it, it takes a village of course, but like, like you mentioned a minute ago, the, the edit is really, you know, after you're wrapped on shooting, the edit is where it all comes together. So it's an important job. Yeah. And, and kind of going along with, um, what you said about, uh, like kind of melding to what the client client wants in terms of of, of style how, how would you say that the style of editing differs between weddings versus promos versus maybe more commercial or even an interview um, how, how would you break that down in your head as an as an editor sure um, well weddings I, I I love talking about weddings with people who are uh, either sorry I'll, I'll, I'll restart this I like bringing up weddings as a really good example of a great way to learn documentary style shooting because ultimately, and with as little cynicism as possible, I, I recently just got married myself, um, <laughs> but you know, wet, weddings, t typical weddings follow a, a pretty general progression throughout the day, right? Like it's pretty high stakes because you only really get one shot at most of this stuff, you know? The, the couple only does their first kiss once and all that, but the reality is that day goes according to a, a pretty general schedule. So as a shooter, that it, it's very good practice for docu-style shooting with a pretty clear outline for how the day is going to go. And so similarly as an editor, you know, every wedding edit I do is different because every you get different footage from every wedding. But at the risk of lifting up the curtain too much, at the end of the day, a wedding edit is going to follow a pretty simple formula. They're typically about three minutes maybe up to five, depending on the couple and, and how much was shot and what their preferences are. It's going to follow a fairly chronological order from the beginning of the day through the end of the day, although I typically do some highlights up front to, to get, you know, get, get the people what they want, you know. <laughs> um, and it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy edit. It's not always easy in the sense that, uh, you know, especially if you're the editor but not the shooter, you're sorting, you're typically sorting through a lot of footage. You are still assembling a story. Um, you know, a lot of times with wedding footage, you, you gotta, you gotta look pretty deep to get your story beats. And I'm talking about like, hmm, this person gives like a nice sentimental look here. It has nothing to do with with this other scene. You know, this is during the reception, but the the look they give is perfect for the moment during the bridesmaid's speech or something like that. Um, <laughs> And I try not, you know, as, as an editor overall, I have my own golden rules about what I will and won't create when I'm cutting something that's supposed to be nonfiction. But everyone wants their wedding video to, to come out nice. There, like I said, there's, there's an expectation and an established narrative. So it's, it's a really great way to, to learn. Uh, sh I, I recommend it to a lot of people who are kind of both shooters and editors. And, and they're, <laughs> it's hardcore, but there's, there's really not a better way to cut your teeth with, with docu-style uh, shooting and editing. <laughs> but to, to kind of answer your question about like, you know, the difference between that and something corporate, um, you know, the, the, the corporate video, which I regret to admit is like really what tends to pay the bills is the more corporate stuff. They're typically looking for something that is, you know, it's a very invisible edit. It disappears into the background. I'm rarely, if ever, doing, you know, fun, like quick chop cuts to a beat. Um, you know, this is typically talking head stuff. They want nice sort of forgettable music underneath it. Um, and, and again, this, this can vary with, with the project and, and you always want to execute what people are looking for. But, um, you know, the, these are also straightforward edits, but with a very different uh, intended outcome. And I guess that's, that's something I always think about, like drawing comparisons between, uh, you know, the zippier editing of, of a wedding edit, which follows this chronological timeline 
versus let's say like a corporate thing where they're highlighting some you know they're highlighting results from the past six months of a particular program or something you know that's that's a totally different style they're they're the pace of the edit is going to be completely different right exactly yeah I don't it know is, if that it is... 100% answers your question no no that was great that was great yeah no it's it's so interesting that um you know, like just the different styles of editing. I feel like a lot, a lot of times when people are like, "Oh, that's a really good edit," they're thinking more about the the edits that stand out. You know, that aren't invisible. Um, but then it, I, I feel like the, almost the invisible edits are sometimes harder to achieve. You know, when you're trying to just make it blend in and really just be very cohesive in something where you're not taken, you know, out of the out of the movie for. Um, for that moment. So it really is quite a balance be between the two and, and, and obviously the, the type of content that you're creating. Yeah, absolutely. The, those invisible edits are, I, I usually measure the success by, you know, essentially the retention rate. Like if it's a fairly dry corporate video, but I can see either from the review software or if I'm in charge of tracking the YouTube analytics or whatever it might be, you know, if, if, if we're seeing decent retention on a five minute video for something pretty dry, I consider that a win on the editor's part, if only because <laughs> it's it's cohesive enough that no one's or a normal amount of people are hanging on through the whole thing. <laughs> With that all being said, um, what what has been like the most challenging project to edit, and and why has it like ha was it any long form projects or was it working with clients? Kind of explain like what what that might be. Yeah. Um... Well, difficult projects come in a couple different flavors. Um, <laughs> one that I don't want to spend too much time talking on, but I think it speaks to the point of, you know, an editor's role is to help execute uh, the, the director or, or the project runner's vision. Um, and I definitely, you know, within the past year was working on a project that I really believed in and was really, it, you know, I was into the project, um, but, you know, it was, uh, it was documentary, so it was not well paid. Um, we'll call this a glorified internship. Um, but it was a really, you know, it, like I said, I believed in the project, but what became clear over a certain amount of time is that the, there was not a clear end vision. And so it became increasingly difficult for me to do my work in a way where it felt like we, it was kind of two steps forward, one step back. And so that's a difficult project to edit because, you know, editing is a very time intensive part of the process. You know, I, I feel like, um, people who work purely on set don't always realize uh you know it takes us as long to edit as it does for you to set up and break down it's you know it's it's an equally time intensive part of the process if not more so if your vision is not entirely clear and so that i think is one flavor of difficult project for an editor is when you know we're here to execute we're here to help bring your vision to life but if you know if we're hearing conflicting things between rounds of feedback it, it gets not only frustrating, but it also gets messy. Um, you know, frankly, it starts to get messy in your project file and you need to put extra work into keeping things sane, duplicated, backed up. You never know when, you know, you could be on V4, uh, but in this situation, you know, something out of V2 becomes absolutely critical. So redundancy becomes an issue. Um, so that's one flavor of frustrating project that I've worked on recently. Um, but in terms of just the, the biggest was, uh, a, a, we'll call it a docu style miniseries I did while working in house for a musical instruments company, um, which was a lot of fun. But it was a lot of footage, a lot of archival stuff, a lot of multi cam shoots, um, a, a, a lot of content where we're dealing not only with multiple audio angles, but we've also got uh, you know the dialogues coming from a boom pole. We've got um, we've got you know mics on the guitar cabs in this case. Uh, we also have a lavalier for safety. We also have, you know, we're tracking the guitar three different ways. It's, it was a lot as an editor to uh, open up that sort of raw asset package for the first time. And I, and I was on set for a lot of this. So I, I kind of knew the wave that was coming for me. But when I opened up like, you know, several terabytes worth of <laughs> audio video feeds, and I had to make sense of it all. And, uh, you know, cut, cut it, cut it down almost like reality TV style where I'm cutting out a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be seen, but I need to still make it feel, uh, you know, as if you're, you're watching something that happened over the course of a couple of days or whatever. Um, so that was, that was definitely a little bit of a brain bender, a little bit of a challenge to just, I don't think I've ever worked so hard just setting up a project file. <laughs> um, 
but the good the good news is once you get to that point you're usually you're usually good unless any of any of your stuff moves around or the links break but yeah that that can be its own unique challenge sometimes just setting up uh you know setting up your project file properly when you're dealing with multiple sources of audio or video maybe your shoot is spread across a couple different cameras that sort of fun stuff that's that's probably the thing that uh i fear the most are big big projects like that that take a while just to set up right how how would what would you say is like you know backing up storage and and organizing everything in an editor's world is like the most important what what is it how do you do that yourself um like walk me through how yeah sure are you asking yeah, more like and i i can answer both but are you asking more like um are you asking more on the digital side like how do i keep everything straight in terms of folders and stuff or you like literally do i i could definitely i could definitely spit some advice about buying hard drives and stuff Oh, go go for both. Yeah, both would Got, be very gotcha. very educational. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so we'll 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 nerd out on both halves of this. Um, <laughs> on, on the literal hardware side, I think I I'm checking my privilege, but I cannot recommend enough just buying a, a, as as large and as high quality of a hard drive as you can early on. This is one of those things, much like buying cheap tripods, where you know, you could buy six cheap ones before you get that, you know, more expensive, whatever, I'm not going to name check a brand for free. Um, like, you know, how, how many cheap tripods do you go through before you just suck it up and, and buy the nice one? And again, I, I recognize that not everyone has the startup capital, but when it comes to hard drives and when it comes to editing, you know, your overhead's not as high as cinematography. You're obviously going to spend on, you know, a capable machine, but the next most important thing is getting good storage media. Um, and I think I made the mistake early on of going for either the cheapest drive I could or prioritizing storage space over uh, transfer speeds, for example. You know, not all, uh, y you could buy a 10 gig hard drive, but not all 10 gig hard drives are sort of made the same. And, uh, or did I say 10 gigs? I'm sorry, I meant 10 terabytes. <laughs> you can leave that in if you want just to embarrass me. But um, uh, w what I mean to say is, you know, like, there are things that you want to look for um, in addition to storage capacity. Your read and write speeds are really important if you want to be editing off of that drive. Like we're deep in the weeds now, but if you want to be able to edit, you know, directly off of a, of a drive, I cannot recommend like SSDs enough. Doesn't mean you can't do it off of a traditional like HDD or spinning disk one, um, but typically, you know, it's going to go a little bit faster. Um, it's going to make your life a little bit easier if you splurge for the SSD. Um, so that's my nerdy advice on buying hard drives. It's it's if you have the ability to do so, go for the like you know uh, buy once, cry once kind of mentality. <laughs> um, one other nerdy thing I'll throw out because I'm just waiting until I have the time really because I'm about to move. But um, I really want to upgrade to like basically a personal cloud, like a um, like a NAS, like network attached storage setup where. I can have like basically these big beefy hard drives sitting at home and as long as I'm connected properly I can access that you know whether I'm like editing on my couch or in theory if I'm you know working outside of my house um so that's that's my nerdy like hardware advice and then on the digital side I just cannot recommend enough uh really fi finding a file structure that works for you uh, something that makes sense to your brain um for me, it's it's pretty. It, it looks insane because I separate everything out pretty pretty aggressively. For example, like I, I'm gonna get real nerdy and see if I can recite it. But I think my file structures look like project files, raw audio, raw video, external audio, external video, graphics, assets from the client. So that that could be like a style guide, specific fonts, logos, stuff like that. Then I usually have like scratch exports and like a deliverables folder. And then even within those, I'll get really nerdy. You know, if I, if, if I've got, like, if I, if I'm working with my own footage, I, I shoot with an FS7 and an A7 III, and I'm going to separate those cameras within raw video as well. Um, so again, like it, it seems really insane, but you don't have to copy that. I guess what I mean to say is like, find something that makes sense for you, like really take a minute to think about it, you test, do, do a test project or, you know, pick like a, a low stakes project that you're working on and, and mess around with how you want to like kind of archive everything like that 
and then don't change it for as long as you can stand to. <laughs> um, that is the number one thing that I've done wrong, that I've seen people do wrong, is not committing to whatever that digital organization structure is, because not only will that confuse you, it's also going to get confusing in well, I, I mostly edit in Premiere and I'm assuming, I know Final Cut works like this and I'm assuming Resolve works similarly. Like if you start messing around with where things are stored or renaming folders or even just putting, uh, you know, your raw video folder inside of a new parent folder, that instantly means you got to go and relink media, which doesn't have to be a huge pain. Like the more specific your folder trees get, the quicker it is to actually go, okay, I got to find this one clip from the FS7 is missing. You can really niche down quickly and find it. So it's a really long nerdy way of saying that be as specific as, as you can, you know, whatever works for your brain, and then just try to stick to it. I, I've made very little changes to the, to the system I just described over the past few years. And there's some things I wanna tweak, but what, what's great about that is I actually just had to open up like a three-year-old project just to retrieve one small asset and <laughs> Because I had transferred it to another storage drive, I did need to relink media, but Adobe's stuff is relatively smart where as soon as I pointed it to the to the new like raw footage folder, it also got raw audio, external audio and video. You know what I'm saying? Like because it's so regimented like that, it does actually allow Adobe to scan through that and relink stuff a little bit more efficiently for you. So now I've gone way into the weeds. <laughs> no, that's great. Oh my gosh. Like I, I still feel, I definitely have like my own way of breaking things down, but there's definitely a way that at least at Drexel, they taught us how to do it. Um, and I feel like a lot of people still use that, but other people, I feel like maybe, at, at least for me, I look at it and I have to tweak it a little bit. Like for me, some of the folders just don't make sense where they are. And I have to like, just kind of like rearrange it myself. But yeah, like sticking to what makes sense for you or whatever is like, I guess, required of you if you work at a bigger company, you know, like sticking to that and like making sense of it and, you know, making sure you don't move anything that shouldn't be moved or renamed or whatever. Yeah, um, absolutely. The, yeah. the system I, the system I just described is 80, 90% the same as, as what I learned from a, from a very like formative internship towards the end of school where I got a lot of, you know, sort of real world training from people that had been out in the wild for a few years and, yeah, I've made I, I've made only a few changes to the setup I learned from that, and it it as with everything, it, it it'll change and flex a little bit with the project. You know, you might always you might not always need a graphics folder, for example. But um, the the last thing I'll say on that, uh, just as like a nerdy little tip, is like save an empty project template. Like I literally just on my desktop, I just have like project title, and it's that it's the whole thing I just described, like all those folders laid out and named. And when I need to start up a brand new project, all I do is copy that to wherever I need to and start populating all the media into that template. And, and I even do things like, <clears throat> excuse me, and I even do things like um, leave a template Premiere and After Effects file in there. And, and those template pro projects already have bins built out for the, the corresponding folders and stuff. So that, that for me is, is a way that I can save time on what can sometimes be a kind of <laughs> tedious and, and, and time intensive part of the process, which is just building your project file. Exactly, exactly. Oh, that's so smart. To me, like being a camera person, I'm just like, ah, I throw it to the editor. But like, I'm like, dang, okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> kind of going off of that and, and, and of what I just said and what you mentioned earlier, what, what's something that you wish people in production would know about crafting like their, their, their shots or their dailies or for DIT or whatever for an editor later in post? I know like a lot of editors don't have, um, aren't able to be on set, you know, while they're shooting something. But I've had a couple, a couple shoots where um, editors have been on set and they give really good advice like, oh, that I don't think that would cut well. If you just moved it a little bit this way, it would cut better. Like that type of thing. Um, what for you, what, what, what's something that you wish people knew that were, that were on production? Yeah. Well, first, I'm so glad to hear that you've had positive experiences having your editors <laughs> on set. Um, super quick sidebar, but I, I, I love to be on set, even if I don't have anything to do, you know, even if I'm not touching the camera at all that day. Um, and, and I see more people doing this. I think, you know, maybe this comes a little bit from, you know, we're in this era where like we all wear multiple hats, right? So there's no, 
in theory, there's no reason your editor might not also be helping out with random, random stuff on set. Like you might actually need their hands for something depending on the size of the project. But I'm really glad that more people are doing this in general because as you just said, like editors tend to think about these things a little bit differently than your cinematographer or your, even your audio person or, or the director. Um, and it can be really helpful. Um, I think to, to close my sidebar, um, if you have the ability to bring your editor on set for any given day of production, I, as, as a director, you'll know which day makes the most sense. But, you know, I, I, I hope some people set aside a little extra in their budget or whatever, you know, beg their editor to come on the cheap or, or buy them lunch or something like it. it can save you so much time and effort to have your editor on set, depending on what type of stuff you're shooting. Um, and you can keep or cut as much of that sidebar as you want. I just love, I love it when directors are like, you know what we should make some room or time for is we should have the editor come at least one day. It, it, <laughs> it makes a huge difference, but, um, okay. Back to task at hand, the actual question you asked, um, as an editor, there's a very fine line between options and overload for us. And this really depends on what the turnaround looks like for a project. Obviously, if you're working on a, a narrative feature that has like a nice long runway still, it's less important than if you're working on event coverage or, um, you know, docu style where you need to at least turn around dailies, you know, within a couple days or something like that. Um, in general, I prefer me personally, I would rather, because I come from the doc world, I would rather sort through more than less. Not every editor feels that way. It really depends <laughs> on the project, but I would rather sort through more than less. When I'm getting dailies or even just cold, you know, highlighted B-roll selects, um, I, would rather, I would rather look through more shots and realize that, you know, a third of these are not really strong or there's a stronger version of them I would rather still have that because sometimes I will choose a, sh a shot that I know is not the strongest shot, but if the strongest one is too short, it's too short. Or if the mo you know if the motion of the scene is better in option B, then then I'll take it. You know, I mean, it, it needs to serve the whole story. So giving me only one select for a particular shot, that might be a banger of a shot, but it might not work with the rest of the edit. But again, I come from the doc world, so like. That's kind of my whole thing is I, w I would rather invest the time in, in looking over more options. But if you're trying to turn around something really quick, re you know, you really just need sort of like the best possible shot and then a fail safe option. Um, another kind of nerdy thing I'll say that I find myself asking for specifically a lot is um, if you're gi if you're giving me selects or dailies, whatever, if you're if you're giving me stuff without without giving me access to the pile of raw footage. Like if you, you know, if you're gonna, for example, send me like ProRes proxies only, so I'm not gonna be able to look for, I'm not gonna be able to like drag the clip out or whatever. Editors love to have a little bit of extra runway. Like I know the shot starts here. Give me, you know, give me 30 frames before that, you know, give me a second or so before that. It, and that's just a really nerdy, like that helps with transitions, that helps with fine tuning the cut. But a lot of times I'm like, I'm dying because there's there's a, a great shot and you know I'm like five frames short of what I need it to cover and that's when you get into this weird territory of like do I do something really do I do like a quick and dirty workaround and try to like interpolate that or <laughs> you know or do I just go back to the pile and hope that there's a, you know a decent option B so generally I guess what I mean to say is like please give your editors handles that really helps <laughs> um, and the last nerdy thing I thought about with this question was, and again, this is me personally, not every editor is going to feel this way, but a, a lot of editors that I'm friends with, we all joke about this all the time. The most effective way you can organize your footage for us, or for me, I'll say, is color coding. Because, what, and, and it depends, you, you, could, you could be color coding according to like, uh, if it's doc or event, and I just need like wide, medium, close up, extreme close up that helps. Or if you're doing it narrative, you know, maybe by scene or by uh, camera angle or by location, what, you know, whatever, making those larger tags, not the text tags aren't helpful, but the reality is if I'm looking through, if I'm scrubbing through a bunch of footage and I've already admitted that I would prefer to take more than less, it's really helpful to know how much more of the wide shot selects there are because I can see, okay, the blue clips end here. And that's just this, that's like I said, that's pretty that that I'll only speak for myself, but I know a few other editors who, 
you know, we'll get these beautifully text tagged, like metadata, you know, perfectly lined up, uh, you know, sh shots or selects or dailies, whatever. But that, <laughs> that still means we need to go through the whole list and it does, it's not as, um, we can't fly through it as fast on, on, on that first, on that first pass. The other thing I can say, similar to what I've already said about your file structure, uh, is, you know, if you're, sh if you're sharing stuff back and forth with an editor, just pick a system that works for you, works for the project and stick with it. It's rare, but I've had it happen where like all of a sudden, you know, I, I get the second package of footage and something is structured differently. And I know this sounds so petty, but it's just like, why, you know, why don't change up how you're organizing your assets halfway through the project. It just confuses your editor. Right. That, yeah, I feel like I wouldn't want to be an editor in that situation for sure. <laughs> yeah. We'll, um, we'll get there. I always tell people, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll get there. You've just added a little bit of time to the turnaround. That's true. That is true. Um, what, what would you say is your favorite, like, um, favorite, like editing style or, or favorite film that you, you, you really love for that style? I, I know you said you're into documentaries. Um, would it be a doc or would it be something, something more narrative? Yeah. Well, fun, funny enough, and you'll find this with a lot of doc people. I, I, I love watching a good doc, but that's not all I watch. I, it's <laughs> less than half of what I watch. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of, I'll answer like kind of on both sides of the fence uh, b because I've talked already about, you know, visible versus invisible editing. And so as far as visible editing goes, currently everything everywhere lives pretty rent free in my head. Just there's so many sequences in that movie that just are mind blowing to anyone. But as an editor, you're just like, you're imagining what their timeline looks like and you're just, yeah, it's just, <laughs> I'm in awe watching this happen. Um, Ba Baby Driver is kind of also in that category. Like I said to you the other night, I, I watched through it kind of just, I hadn't seen it in a while. I really liked it. It came, it came out pretty much at the end of film school for me. So I went back and watched it just to see uh, if it holds up and, uh, it, you know, like to what extent I should even bring it up. Um, and it is a really, really fun edit style. It The concept is basically what if, you know, every musical beat during our action sequences had a visual beat corresponding to it. So as a musician and as an editor, love it love it but as i also admitted to you the plot is just so thin for that movie so i i give a i give a qualified qualified thumbs up for baby driver um don't don't go looking for like high drama but do go looking for just super fun edits um but on a slightly more serious note about like the invisible editing one of my favorite docs um is sorry one of my favorite documentaries uh, for invisible editing is one called Dear Zachary, which, have you seen this film? No, I haven't. What What is it? Can I give like a, a, a pitch log on? Uh, it is, oh God, you're gonna, you're majorly gonna have to cut this because I don't want to give anything away. Um, <laughs> Dear Zachary is a very well-produced and sad story about a very tragic legal case. Um, and the reason, I, I, I can't spoil anything. I highly recommend you watch it. I am giving you a loud and clear like content warning that it's, it's, a harrow, it, it's an emotionally harrowing documentary to watch. Um, I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. But the reason I think it's really impressive as an editor is that without spoiling anything, the the story is not over by the time the documentary concludes it's one of those and the reason i find this so interesting as an editor specifically coming from the doc world is this is something we think and talk about a lot in in that vein of production which is when do you stop rolling a camera when is a project done um you know when when is it appropriate to call something done if the story is still evolving um why would you make the choice to cut something off when uh, there are active, you know, there's there's new story beats actively developing. And so I don't want to say too much more than that, just because if you haven't seen this film, I, I really do recommend it with the qualifier that it's not necessarily an uplifter. Um, I'm I'm scared. If, if you want, I can, sorry, I'm, I'm breaking a little bit from podcast mode, but if, if you want, I can look up a, like, I can look up what the synopsis says so I can say something a little more specific without ruining anything, but I'm just so scared of spoiling it. That's all. 
No, that's okay. You you, you can continue. I think okay. I think you gave a pretty good a pretty good um a good pitch out there for people to go watch this film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so to bookend that thought, as an editor, I really respect the approach they took to that project, um, and the challenge of of producing something like that, of following a story for I believe several years and deciding that f for one reason or another, you know, now's the time when we're going to, you know, call cut on the project and um, the impacts that that has on, on a story that's still evolving in real time. So it's it's a really, really interesting film and definitely recommend checking it out. I feel like as a as as I'm definitely more of like a narrative type of person when I'm when I'm, you know, doing film stuff. Um, but like documentary, I think is something at, at least from the school that uh, that I came from is not or I feel like a, mo a lot of film schools, they don't touch upon documentaries as much as they do narratives. So, you know, hear, hearing like um, just kind of like how, how you break down a documentary or 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 just like, yeah, just it's just really interesting to me. <laughs> personally yeah yeah i mean that's uh we, we we don't have enough we don't have enough time in the world to uh to talk about all the different like sub genres within documentary which i only roll my eyes because it's it's something that we were talking about when i was in school and the conversations like kind of only gone in circles since about <laughs> um you know there there's a big big difference obviously between um you know like verite style documentary fly on the wall like you know the 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 people that are making the film are really not there or they're not supposed to be perceived. Um, and that's massively different than kind of like the current era we're in of like Netflix docs, which like I love that streaming platforms have, have been, become like a, a pretty, a relatively accessible source of funding for nonfiction filmmakers. Like I, I think that's awesome and it works out for both parties sometimes. Um, <laughs> again, don't have enough time to talk about like the streaming economy. But what, what I mean to say is like we're in this current era of documentaries that very much have a point to make. And I think that's something that people don't often think, you know, people think documentaries are like these objective, like vehicles for truth. And honestly, even in Verite, that's not what's happening. Um, you know, s something I took away from from the documentary coursework I had, and, and most of it was documentary coursework, is we talked a lot about like, you know, there is no such thing as like an objective documentary. Like everyone, everyone is making a point of some sort. Um, and it's kind of a misnomer to think of them as, uh, you know, it's nonfiction, but that doesn't mean it's objective. Everything from the person holding the camera to, um, you know, where you choose to interview your subject, that all matters. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of different types of documentary. And um, so there's a lot of different kinds of there's a lot of different kinds of films within what we consider a documentary. And I think different editing styles, you know, serve those different projects in different ways that's awesome no that's that's super cool like like docs that's all i'll leave it at <laughs> they're awesome go yeah. watch them educate yourself um there's a lot of ways that you can watch docs and yeah it's such a, it's a cool time to be in where docs are kind of being more praised these days for sure yeah definitely okay so now we're gonna play like a little film would you rather it's just one question but yes. it's catered towards your um the the subject of today so would you rather um or kind of like which one would you like would you rather like edit jump cuts or smash cuts mm. do you have a preference I... of which one you like more or yeah <laughs> i like jump cuts and i'm this is a very interesting question if if i can wax on it for a second i like jump cuts but i think that's because i come from a I, I came up on a different generation of youtube than ev even yourself um i feel like smash cuts are you know uh, smash cuts feel like a few years later than like like when like when i was in like middle school first messing around with the camera first just getting into the fact that youtube existed again if you haven't seen the film dd the character is like eerily the same age as me so like I, I could just refer you to that film for like what it felt like <laughs> to be getting into filming around that time. Um, yeah, it was, it was all like, it, it was all like sort of early YouTube sketch comedy. And so much of that was like randomness and like this very millennial sensibility of like, it's so wacky and random. So like jump cuts were way more common than smash cuts with like, you know, someone, uh, less a sketch and more like a monologue or almost like a pseudo stand-up feel and the smash cuts are kind of how you emphasize like the punchline um whereas 
I think of so many, you know, classic early comedy videos that I loved and I'm like, oh, the joke is the, the jump cut. Like the, the, the timing of the jump cut is the joke as opposed to an emphasis. So anyway, I don't know if that went way off the rails from what you were expecting, but I would rather edit jump cuts than smash cuts. Alrighty. Yeah. I, they're, they're so different, but they kind of have the same like end goal, but they do it in a different way for sure. And then kind of the, the final question that um, I've been asking everyone, um, it's if you could tell your younger self something, um, what would, what advice would you give them if they were going to start in the film industry? Mm. I'm going to take a quick second to think about this. Cause I, like I mentioned earlier, I have that sort of weird, like, I didn't always dream of this, but I didn't realize I loved it at the last second either. So I'm going to take one second. I think if I could tell my younger self something, and I'm, I'm picturing really my younger self. I, I'm picturing the kid who's getting into making skate videos with his friends. Um, I think, I think I would tell, I would tell that younger version of myself that, um, you know, this, this can be, this could be your job if you want it to be. And you can, if you Hang on. I'm almost like, do I even want to say this? Because it's so weird. Like, I, I, can't, I came to where I am how I did. So w what I'm trying to say is, like, I would probably tell my younger self to take it a little bit more seriously sooner. But at the same time, I don't know if I would be the same, you know, producer editor that I am now without the path I've taken. So I'm going to take one more crack at this for you. I think I would <laughs> tell my young... <laughs> I, I think I would tell my younger self that um, as silly as it feels making skate videos with your friends, those actually are completely valid skills that you're learning, even if it's just realizing what makes for a better shot, you know, um, for stuff in the foreground, facing away from the sun. I'm talking really 101 stuff. Um, I would encourage myself to take that a little bit more seriously, um, take it as seriously as I was taking music at the time, as in... I was taking lessons and playing with other people. Um, yeah, in hindsight, I would have encouraged myself to foster a little bit more. I think I felt like it was just a, a silly hobby adjacent to my like pretty lame skateboarding career. Um, but you know, if I if I could randomly teleport back and just be like, no, like, you know, you came to it through skating, but this is going to be way more important to your life. That's awesome. It's it's crazy when you think back to your younger self and you. You know, and you're like, oh, this one thing influenced this whole other thing, and you would never have known. It's kind of a cool, crazy, wrap your head kind of phenomenon. You know, really, yeah, very, it's, it's very quite special. Full too. circle. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. This was really fun and a really nice break from my moving weekend. This is like <laughs> while I was packing boxes this morning, I was like, cool. Well, I have this to look forward to later in the afternoon. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. How how can people find you on, on social media? Uh, I am public on Instagram at trent.burns underscore because there's another Trent Burns out there who never posts and doesn't have that many followers, but still maintains <laughs> their Instagram account. Um, <laughs> I'm not super, super active on Instagram, but uh, you can find me there. And I have a portfolio site, which is uh, tburns.work. I don't know where in the world has a dot work domain name, but I, I snagged one and that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm uh yeah, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not hugely on socials at the moment. Uh, life's just been pretty busy, especially with the move and I got married earlier this year, so I'm not very active, but you can find me there. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll see you around. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Mel. See ya. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to learn more about my experience as an up-and-coming filmmaker or catch up on more episodes, follow me on Instagram at M-E-L-Y-D-E-12. This podcast is also available on Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Please like, subscribe, and spread the word. Thank you guys again, and that's a wrap.